Chase looks like he's doing the commercial for uh, the North Face. Look at him. <laughs> <laughs> Act like you're throwing a football. Give it one of those. <laughs> Put your chin up. There you go. <laughs> That's it. That's it. That's it. Or do the one where you look at your, at your, you do the time and one of those. Do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's definitely, that's knitwear catalog where you're looking, where you're looking <laughs> pointing at your watch and, and, and looking somewhere That's out. it. That's the one. Yeah, that's yeah. the one. You're that's right. why that, you, have to, you have to have your knee up on something as well. <laughs> I'm getting a <laughs> I did a Vogue photo shoot and they had me do the same thing. He's like, okay, look at your watch. Okay, but don't look at it. Look off. Like there's a bus coming. He said, there's a bus coming. Look for the bus. Look for the bus. I'm Scott Rouse, my body language expert and analyst. And I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online body language course, Body Language Tactics with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they speak, including some of the leaders of the G7. I am the proud owner of Six Minute X-Ray by Chase Tandaddy Hughes. Chase. Thanks, Mark. I'm Chase Hughes, did 20 years in the US military, and now I teach persuasion, influence, and people reading to the general public and intelligence agencies. Greg? I'm Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor, written 10 books on body language and behavior, and this bodylanguagetactics.com course with Scott. And I spend most of my time on Wall Street and in corporate America. All right. Well, if you like what we're doing, please subscribe to this channel. We really appreciate it. Just that little red thing down there, click that, and the little bell will show up and click that too, and you'll know when we're We've got something coming out. We come out every Thursday, sometimes on Wednesdays if I get them edited quick enough. All right. Well, today we're going to talk about a guy named Vlad Tenev. Uh, it's the guy from uh, Robin Hood, the app that where you where you invest. It lets the first time investor invest with no problems, or it doesn't cost anything to invest with it. So that's who we're going to talk about. He's in a lot of trouble, or could be in a lot of trouble. His ethics are in question as to what he did when. The sales of the the stocks of AMC and uh, what was it, and GameStop went through the roof, and he made it so you couldn't invest anymore. You couldn't buy any more of the stocks. You could sell them, but you couldn't buy them at at a certain point. So that's what he's being questioned about, and that's the video we're going to take a look at today. All right, ready? Yeah. Yep. Here we go. I want you to address the obvious. This looks like a move by an outfit called Robin Hood, which is supposed to be taken from the rich and given to the poor, and doing exactly the opposite. That when the big guys, including one of your main investors in your company, started to lose, you shut down the game to starve the little guy. Fair criticism. That's not what it is at all. And I know you started this segment. Um, it really resonated with me because you, you described the story of Robin Hood. Robin Hood started five years ago by pioneering commission-free, no account, minimal mobile investing. And we've been the spokesperson of the individual investor. And our whole goal as an institution is to enable those customers, empower them, and give them access to the markets. Because for the longest time, markets have been only accessible to the wealthy. And so the entire industry adopted our business model in 2019. And in 2020, um, we added millions of new customers. The entire industry added millions of new customers who took advantage of the market rally and became investors for the very first time. So, you know, we had to make a very difficult decision to protect uh, our customers and our firm. Why? Uh, but we in no way. Uh, Why? All right, Chase, what do you got? Right off the bat here, we see anger, right when he's saying that's not what it is at all. And there's a shoulder shrug and head shaking and eye blocking all at the same time. And when he says we're a spokesperson for the individual investor, the only point is in this whole thing that he's talking about, this is when the tone starts to go upward and he's starting to put these invisible question marks at the ends of his sentences. However, this is the way he talks normally, but it's interesting to note when he doesn't say those things and when he doesn't do this in the video. As Greg says all the time, he's obsessed with body language and he's obsessed with baseline. These deviations are very important. And I think there's a constant eyebrow raise when he's speaking about Robin Hood, the company, and this is an approval-seeking, apologetic 
tone that he's taken throughout the entire thing. And there's continuous shoulder shrugging, which is in body language is an apology. We typically say, well, I'm, I'm not sure or I don't know. So it's kind of an apology behavior. And when he's saying there's, it's a difficult decision, he starts nodding instead of shaking his head. Then he says, when and we're protecting our customers, and then he shakes his head no. And less than a second later, he says, and our firm, and he goes back to nodding again. And I think it's important to note that the only time here he's really shaking his head no is when he's saying, we're gonna protect our customers. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I usually say when someone holds their forehead up, it is a request for approval. I went back and looked at this guy's baseline, and he has a really good eye contact as part of his baseline, and he illustrates, meaning punctuates his thoughts with his forehead. But it's quick, and it's moving and drops. You'll notice that as he gets to the point he really requests approval in here, he's going to hold that forehead up. He's going to hold all that wrinkled forehead, and you'll notice it's more pregnant looking. It isn't a, this is not simply him dropping and raising his brow as he makes his point while he's still making eye contact. So we'll look for a handful of those as he does request approval. Early in this video, you see when they mention Robin Hood, his face light up, that recognition. You see he literally, his cheeks rise, he starts into a smile and he thinks, well, this is good. They're gonna say good things about me. And that's a feeling he's getting because they're talking about something. And that story of Robin Hood's what he's talking about. Chase, I'll steal one of yours. He makes a resume statement. We are this. He wants to show you I am the person who has done this. Um, this guy has got some prepared stuff, and you're going to see it because, and I'm going to hop off right after this, data intake. His eyes are moving back, left, and right. Whether he's looking at another screen or someone sitting there, or he's looking at a tablet, whatever it is, he is getting data. He's intaking data to deal with this situation that's about to come. And here early, we see a swallow and fight or flight increases, his respiration increases, and his blink rate increases. So he knows he's on the grid because he's already asked a question right after saying something positive. That's what I got. Scott, what do you got? All right. Well, I know this personality type. I'm very familiar with it. I was the entrepreneur in residence at the Nashville Entrepreneur Center from 2011 to 2017. And during that, I created the pitch department. And I've worked with thousands of entrepreneurs, not just from there, but from around the United States. And I don't think I've worked with this guy before. I don't remember him. But he's doing everything you do in a pitch. That's what he's doing. He's pitching here. So what we're seeing when that when he first says, you know, whatever whatever it is about Robin Hood, and he says something sort of a little bit nice about it. That's when Vlad jumps in and says, you know, I resonate with what you with what you said there. He's trying to connect with me. Smiles and he's doing. And when his eyebrows go up, he's trying to get his eyes open wide so he looks innocent as he speaks with him. And then he starts nodding his head yes. Now, what you're doing in that time when you get those eyebrows up and you start not, nodding your head yes, you're trying to get your their mirror neurons to match with you. So when you start shaking your, you'll start shaking. They'll start shaking their head while you're shaking your head. People do it naturally when you're telling them something. So at that part, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing him go into pitch mode here, and he's an excellent pitch guy because everything is in as in these blocks of information as they should be as he goes along. His words aren't creating the picture they're supposed to create, which you do when you pitch. You try to create a picture of that business and how well it's going to do that you can give to this person, and they can pop it out of their head and give it to whoever they're talking to so they can go home and tell their wife or their husband or their partner, whoever it is, well, what are you going to invest in? With our three hundred fifty thousand dollars or one point two million, what's this? And they pop it in their head. He's not doing that here, but he's doing everything but that. So there's nothing, nothing creative going on here. It's just him being analytical. Every time his eyebrows go up like this, he's talking about finances. And when, he, when he's creating stuff and he's thinking about what he's going to say, you'll see his eyebrows go down almost in a frown. But when they're back up, he's always talking about finances and he's reading what he's saying from a little, from one of the screens there. It's, it's probably on a screen, but it may be on a sheet of paper because his eyes dart back and forth from Cuomo to himself, to his to what he's reading, to himself, to Cuomo, to, and it goes back and forth there. We don't see it happen a whole lot here. We don't, we don't see him popping around, but in a few minutes we'll see him, and in a couple of videos down, we'll see him doing that. Another thing we need to uh, pay attention to is the eye flutter before he starts that pitch. Before he starts talking, you see this little eye flutter, and that's him getting everything out of the way to go down that path of pitching his idea or his, his product or service. That's, that's the way you do it. He only blinks seven times throughout that whole answer, through, throughout his 39-second 
elevator pitch. He blinks seven times. That's not a whole lot for 39 seconds for 40 seconds when you go in there. And his eyes are open because he knows he's on the hot seat and it's new. We just started. Here we go. Here's who I am. And that's why he's sitting like this. He's very contained and very under control. And you don't see a whole lot of movement. His illustrators are his eyebrows and his head as he's moving around. And we'll see that get, he'll engage with those more as we move, as we move along as well. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so nonverbal behavior, it isn't just what you're doing with your hands, with your face. It's actually also the environment that you're in as well, the environment that you show yourself in, you create, or you allow yourself to be seen in. When we look at his environment, I think we see something where he's placed some things there in order to give us an idea about him. So I thought I would investigate that environment by getting that footage uh, into Photoshop, blowing it up so I could see what images he's trying to show us, especially that book to the side because I thought, well, you know, if I can work out what book he's trying to tell me, I might understand something about his value system and therefore what he's trying to project, as, as Chase might say, you know, the mask that he wants us to see. So I did that and I can't tell what book that is. So look, if anybody can, can look at that image and tell me what book that is, you know, put it down below. But in investigating him and books, I did find out what his prescribed reading list is, what he thinks you and I should read. And two titles come up that are very important. Plato's Republic, it's one of the first books on democracy, essentially, and uh, Animal Farm, which is, of course, Orwell's book on the uh, troubles of uh, centralizing power. And so he calls his business Robin Hood because we get some of his value system from that. He's about the redistribution of of wealth in a more democratic way from the people who don't have it right now, sorry, from the people who have it right now to the people who don't have it right now. And that's why I believe where we get a big swallow gesture from him when the interviewer says, you're doing the exact opposite of what your business says it's going to do, which is be a Robin Hood and rob from the rich and give to the poor. You've done the exact opposite of that. That is a hit for that interviewer, a palpable hit, because he's hitting right at the core of what, how he believes the world should work. So we get that big swallow gesture. Uh, we get those eyebrow raises, as people have said, those looks for approval. As he starts to try and tell his story, he goes back in history to here's why this company is around. I think to, to one of Greg's phrases, it's a bit of chaff and redirect. Let me not address the question at all. Let me tell you, you know, why on a philosophical level, I've created the company that I've created, all that resonance piece to get Get us on his side, talks about the growth of the business, and then at the end of it, he frames himself as the victim. It's been very difficult for him or for us, the business in this situation. So just that to give you what I think is a little bit of a, of a baseline around his values, what's important for him, and therefore for an interviewer or an interrogator during this, what are the things we could really kind of trigger on? What are the hot buttons that we could get him upset around? And I think because of that, we'll see the, the stress in him peak and the panic build up throughout this. Uh, I think that's all of us, isn't it? I want you to address the obvious. This looks like yeah. a move by an outfit called Robin Hood, which is supposed to be taken from the rich and given to the poor, and doing exactly the opposite. That when the big guys, including one of your main investors in your company, started to lose, you shut down the game to starve the little guy. Fair criticism. That's not what it is at all. And I know you started this segment, um, it really resonated with me because you you described the story of Robin Hood. Robin Hood started five years ago by pioneering commission-free, no account, minimal mobile investing. And we've been the spokesperson of the individual investor. And our whole goal as an institution is to enable those customers, empower them, and give them access to the markets. Because for the longest time, markets have been only accessible to the wealthy. And so the entire industry adopted our business model in 2019. And in 2020, um, we added millions of new customers. The entire industry added millions of new customers who took advantage of the market rally and became investors for the very first time. So, you know, we had to make a very difficult decision to protect uh, 
our customers and our firm. Why? Uh, but we in no way. Uh, why? Yep. Y'all ready? Perfect. Yeah. Perfect to go. All right. Why? Anything, Explain why you protect. had to do it if it wasn't to protect the guys who had shorted uh, the stocks, which are the big hedge funds. How are you helping the little guy investors? Well, I know that there's rumors around that, um, you know, we were directed by market makers or other market participants to do this. And I want to be 100 percent clear. This decision was not made on the direction of any market maker or uh, other market participants. There's so why did you do it? Decision. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so he's doing something here I refer to usually when a person is standing behind a podium and dancing around. He's doing something I refer to as the chained elephant. That means I need to tether myself to something, but I need to move around to get away from it. We saw it in Trump doing the chained elephant when he would stand behind the, the podium and try to move. There's a real deep swallow at why. This is an indicator that this guy has recognized a threat. When you recognize a threat, now your amygdala goes into action, dumps all those stress hormones in your system. Now you're gonna dry out mucous membranes, your blink rate increases, your throat gets dry, you swallow, and we see all that happen in microseconds right in front of us. He starts to illustrate, guarantee you somebody told him, don't move your hands because we don't see it much, but he's starting to try to illustrate. And then he does this self-editing speaking where he says something like, well, I know there is rumors around that, um, you know. And then his eyes look down as he tries to recall what he should say and try to go after it. If he were standing up, he would be dancing around and he would be nodding and doing all kinds of bobbling his head. And somebody's smart enough to know that and has put him in a chair and, and framed him in this situation. He is now in fight or flight. He's now trying to deal with something, trying to string sentences together. And he's also looking at whatever he has in front of him, monitor or whatever, to try to pull the right data into place at the right time. Now, I'll also say this. I work sometimes with people who are involved in Wall Street, private equity and other folks. These are good people, people. Most of them are more polished than average people in picking up on signals, and they're excellent salespeople. A guy on Wall Street said to me one time, innately in their nature is the ability to sell. And I think he's right. But when you get in a grid where this guy's punching you in the face and going after you, now you're trying to say the right thing, and you're trying not to say the wrong thing, fight or flight's going to rise. And that's what I think we're seeing now. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I definitely agree with you. There's when he, As soon as he mentions there's rumors out there, we see the eyebrows come down and together. I think there's some anger around that. And he starts shaking his head no again, and he's showing his baseline from the first video that we started to see this. He disagrees with things and shakes his hands like when he's – or sh I'm sorry, shakes his head like when he said – we're taking care of our customers, he started shaking his head no. And I think that's a very interesting data point here. His eyebrows dart back upward, breathing rate increases here into his chest, not his abdomen. So we can breathe from both spots. If you watch a sleeping human or any sleeping animal, you'll see the abdomen is the thing that rises and falls. And the time that he's explaining, let me make this 100% clear with this market maker uh, decision thing, he's looking for confirmation at the TV host. So he's looking at Chris on the screen, I think, and I think his eyes shift to watch himself on the screen for the remainder of his answer. Scott, what do you got? All right. What we're seeing here is another Hartleyism. It's chaff and redirect. When he gets asked the question, he talks about everything but the answer. And, and he never gives the right answer. Uh, he never answers the question during this. We see, um, again, when he's talking off the cuff, when he's making, when he's creating something, his eyebrows go down when he's in defense. And he, but when he starts talking about finances and anything else, his eyebrows go up. And he's giving his, his stock, either his stock answer or he's reading it, like Chase was saying. And I think a lot of times what we're seeing is, is he's using his himself, a vision of himself, uh, his reflection as his adapter. Adapters are the things you use to get rid of that built up stress and tension to make you feel better. He's not doing anything. He's not moving anywhere much at all, except for using his eyebrows and his head as his illustrators. So mm -hmm. instead of doing this and adapting or chewing, on, or chewing gum like I do, what he's doing is he's looking at himself because he'll look at he'll look at Cuomo. He'll look back down his notes and he looks at himself. Who's at Cuomo? But when he gets heated up, he locks in on himself and that helps relax him. I could be wrong about that. I don't think I am. And I don't think we're dealing with a, a big narcissistic situation here. I just think that's how he's helping calm himself down. Um, but those are the three places he looks at. And as he goes through this, 
He doesn't say I, I think he says I in this whole thing three times and me once. And what he's doing is he's separating himself by saying we, the company, because he's asking, what do you, why did you do this? And it's like, well, it's we, us, we and us. And that's what we're seeing at this point. Him trying to, he begins this, this journey of separating himself from uh, the problem and he's making it our problem or our, the company's problem. It's not just me or it's not only me. Um, so that's what I got. And Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so uh, absolutely, I concur with everything there. The pressure is on here. Uh, the swallow gesture, the breathing we get. Let's be even more specific about that breathing. If you want to watch breathing rate, look for the notch here or the top button, or you can see movement here. We see it's, it's big and up and in the chest, as Chase was saying, and then it will suspend, it will hold, which is my guess is in panic, he's gone to freeze. Yeah, he keeps on talking, but the rest of the body has gone to freeze. You'll have often come across people who are in panic and you have to say, look, breathe, 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 because they've stopped breathing. They're in fight and flight and freeze is the first aspect of that. I think because of that, we're getting blood start to drain from the head at this point. And I think that's why we see a little bit of a head wobble at that point, which is the first start of the faint response as well. So my guess is, is the heart is now going up in order to try and push blood up to the head, keep that brain working, because in fight and flight, at the end of that, the faint response, uh, the body wants to get horizontal, so the heart doesn't have to work so hard to get blood to the to the brain. I think that, that knockout is starting to happen. He's under so much pressure. The face actually shifts away from the interviewer when when he talks about the decision was not made on the direction of any market makers. So I think the, um, the interviewer is partly on the knockout question here. And that's why his head moves away going, I don't want you to hit me full on with, with that piece there. However, I don't think it's the best question that could be asked. And, and this is why, because just because it wasn't made on the direction of any market maker or other doesn't mean that they weren't considered in the action. And here's the important thing is, yes, their platform is, is free uh, for you to invest via. They make their money partly from some of the transactions that are made with the market makers. But my understanding is, and you can correct me down below if I'm wrong about this, but my understanding is, is they sell data to market makers and hedge funds in order that those market makers and hedge funds can get some insight into what investors are doing en masse. So you as the investor are the product here. Your data is the product doesn't mean that those buyers of that data instructed them to do anything, but those buyers of data are a customer of Robinhood, a big customer of Robinhood. Might they take them into consideration when they're thinking about what they're doing? That's the question really I think needs asking here is, did you consider some of the buyers of your data and the market makers when you came to make this? Was it any consideration of yours at all? That's the real question here. And that question isn't asked, which allows him to go, the decision was not made on the direction of any market maker. Probably true, but it doesn't mean they weren't considered. That's what I've got on that one. And I think, I think that's all of us. Yeah, uh, let me add. Let me add one thing back. I, yeah. I, I, in my notes, that I didn't pay attention. He does an asymmetric facial expression just before he says that when he turns his head, and he also does a tongue jut, which is interesting, because all that's distaste and trying to get away from it, the knockout punch, whatever it is. This is going to start him down the path of spiraling into some fight or flight, and now he's going to have mm -hmm. to deal with that. Doesn't mean that he loses himself, but fight or flight causes that frontal lobe to start disengaging, and the rest of our our all of our primitive systems, our limbic system to say, okay, time for the door. And he doesn't get that luxury here. Why? Anything Explain why you had to do it if it wasn't to protect the guys who had shorted uh, the stocks, which are the big hedge funds. How are you helping the little guy investors? Well, I know that there's rumors around that, um, you know, we were directed by market makers or other market participants to do this. And I wanna be 100% clear this decision was not made on the direction of any market maker or uh, other market participants. There's so why'd you do it? Decision. Cool. All right. We good? Great. Yep. There we go.
So why'd you do it? Robinhood, uh, as a brokerage, has lots of financial requirements, SEC requirements. We have to put up money at clearing houses. The amount of money that we have to put up depends on market volatility. And we're in historic, uh, we're in a historic situation where there's a lot of activity and a lot of buying concentrated in a relatively small number of symbols that are going viral on social media. So we haven't really seen anything like this before. And to, to prudently manage uh, the, the risk and the deposit requirements, uh, we had to restrict buying in these 13 stocks. But customers that held them could sell throughout. Uh, thousands of other securities and stocks on our platform were available to freely trade. And our number one priority as you mentioned, is to make sure our platform is reliable, stable for our customers. We're serving our customers and giving them the tools. But that's exactly and what's we're a doing question everything now. in our power to turn it back on as soon as prudent. Okay, Chase, what do you got? So right off the bat, we see a single shoulder shrug here while he is describing their role. And I think it's kind of interesting here that we see it right there when he's talking about what the company's role is. This single shrug when one, one shoulder goes up means that somebody lacks confidence in what they're saying. And he starts shaking his head no when he says SEC requirements. He nods, just a slight nod, and you'll see it coming up when he's talking about clearing houses. So he shifts from a no to a nod in less than a second. The eyebrows are, again, constantly raised in this need for approval from the other person. And he has this upward tone when he shifts for the to get this agreement when he's talking about this is a historic situation. It, the tone goes downward again when he's referring to facts and the, the social media involvement. Tone goes back up when he's saying we haven't seen anything like this before. And then he's shaking his head no again when he's saying this is, we're prudently managing this or we're doing this prudently. And he said... When, he, when we're talking about these 13 stocks, we we didn't want to restrict buying in these 13 stocks. And please keep in mind, I know nothing about the stock exchange whatsoever. But we're seeing a shrug with both shoulders, which is apologetic again. And I'm beating a dead horse here uh, outlining these behaviors. But two things are important. Number one, we're starting to see what his baseline looks like. We're seeing the nodding, the head shaking, the eyebrow movement, the blink rate, which is like a zero. And we're seeing how he responds with his tone going up or going down at the end of things. If we scored the last video we watched on the behavioral table of elements, he would have got a 17. And all you need to be likely deceptive is an 11. This video here scored a 15. Scott, what do you got? All right. Well, on this one, I think we're seeing him in panic because he starts condensing everything he's talking about into the least amount of words possible. So, and this is what happens when you start button up against an entrepreneur and ask them questions they're not used to. You may be dealing with a situation with a, with a CEO who's doing the pitch and they should be doing the pitch. And if you ask them about the finances, they may not know all about the finances, but they've got a financial person they can ask. So the financial person is giving them these, these answers to these questions that might show up. So when they give these answers that are they believe are true, they're not really sure because they didn't do them themselves. What did you find out about the finances? And they'll you'll see him back up just a little bit. We're seeing just these really, really subtle things in this guy's, um, and when he moves back, when we're, when we're seeing deception here, a lot of little subtle things. He's not loping. Loping is I, something I talk about where someone's talking and they're telling you a story that sounds like there's a loping along talking about it. These are just a very straight line and very uh, chunked up groups of information as he goes because he's reading this and he's got his his uh his highlights of what he's going to talk about is his bullet points so he's covering those as he goes down then trying to look over at, at cuomo then looking at himself again and then trying to look at, at, at his notes so we see him when he's again when he's making not making stuff up when he's he's talking from how he would when he's speaking from his own voice his eyebrows go down like this but when they come back up every time he starts reading something or he's just puking out his prepared statement that's what we're seeing here um this is this is what happens in a pitch after when you're doing deal, uh, due diligence greg you'll be familiar with this because 
these, this is the kind of look you'll see, and these are the kind of questions you ask. So you need that hardcore, right to the point information, which this guy has given, right to the, just right on the button for each one of them, because he knows he's not just given to this guy. He's given it to everybody in the financial world, everybody he's pitched with, everybody he knows, everybody he's been watching that company and going, is this guy good or not? Boy, he's a, he's brilliant. He's got to look and sound brilliant as he goes through this. So we're seeing that language that's just it's high end. Uh, pitch language, in other words, when you're when you're defending what you're talking about. Greg and I have a thing in in the true crime workshop. That's a course we do, and we talk about when you when you uh, when you recognize the threat. He's already recognized the threat, and he's in trouble. But he's going as he goes through this. He's trying to think ahead to uh, make sure there are no pro to deconflict any problems he may have coming up. So that's why these things are really tight. So. You, to get in and to, and to flip these things over and to get under them, you've got to say something out of out of context with what he's with what he's talking about. It has to not sound correct or doesn't sound right. It sounds iffy, and he's not doing that here. Everything is perfect. Everything is sounds just as it should as he goes along because he's reading it and he knows his bullet points. So he's ready for this. That's what I got. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so this guy's got a communications director guaranteed. This is a corporation. This is not you know Bob's trading platform. This is a guy with a business and he's got a communications director who's probably very experienced. Haven't looked any of that up. I could, but this is on message. Yeah. Is he showing a little fight or flight? Yes. But I've watched him enough to know he's on message. He's delivering his message. He's delivering the chunks the way he should. This is CEO 101. You, I see CEOs all the time who deliver messages and they prep. He may or may not have rehearsed, but he has a clear defined message he's going to go. He has a cadence and that cadence is his, whatever, you know, his is different. Interestingly, remember I said request for approval, his brow is up. When he's illustrating, it just does this. His brow comes up very high at money, at historical, at viral, and at unprecedented. Those are places that he's trying to say, hey, we're in an unusual turf. And he's also being very cautious to walk the knife's edge and not create any kind of fear that he may not have enough money to cover this or that something else may create. He's doing exactly what he should. And I think he's, you know, this is a 33 year old guy, not a 63 year old CEO. And in front of some really high pressure here, I think he's delivering exactly what he's been told and he's reading his points and he's covering it. I think we'll see a very different guy in a couple of minutes, but I think he's doing a pretty good job of staying on message and delivering what he needs to here. That's it. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so uh, Chase, who who knows nothing about you know stock and finance, picks up there on the difference between clearinghouse and SCC. That subtle difference there. So what might that mean? Here's what I understand about this. And listen, you can put down below if I'm wrong about this. Is the fact is is the SCC has no issue with this. The SCC is not an issue. Could be further down the line, but at this point zero issue with compliance there. The issue is with the clearing houses and liquidity. Do you have enough money to put up the stocks that you want to trade for your customers? That, my understanding, is the factual issue here. And I think that's why Chase is hearing that difference between the two. They're being put in the same bucket of compliance, but one is asking for compliance and the other doesn't care at this point. So here's what I pick up on, which I think is most important here, is there's pain on the face, a pained face, an eye block, the eye, the eyelids close com completely, and there's a swallow gesture on restrict buying. What does that tell me? That idea of restricting the buying is super important. He's gone against the real premise of what the business is about, which is allowing people who normally wouldn't get access to buying or selling, allowing them access to, first of all, the first thing you have to do before you can sell anything is you got to buy it. You got to have it. And he's shut down the buying element of it to prudently manage this situation. Well, prudently manage what the customer primarily wants to do, which is first of all buy, he shut down that element of it. So he has ultimately ditched the whole premise of the company, I would say, and his whole value premise, which is to democratize that ability to first of all buy so that you can then sell. 
And that's why it's such an issue. That's why we see the pain. The eye block could almost be potentially a little bit of shame around that. I think the head tilts down a touch as he closes his eyes and that swallow gesture as the pressure is put on. So underlying what we could see there as, hey, you know, he's doing a good corporate job, I'd say beneath that, there's some real personal pressure on his value system there. And that's all I got for you. Excellent. So, so why'd you do it? Decision. Robinhood, uh, as a brokerage, has lots of financial requirements, SEC requirements. We have to put up money at clearing houses. The amount of money that we have to put up depends on market volatility and we're in historic. Uh, we're in a historic situation where there's a lot of activity and a lot of buying concentrated in a relatively small number of symbols that are going viral on social media. So we haven't really seen anything like this before. And to to prudently manage uh, the the risk and the deposit requirements, uh, we had to restrict buying in these 13 stocks. But customers that held them could sell throughout. Uh, thousands of other securities and stocks on our platform were available to freely trade. And our number one priority, as you mentioned, is to make sure our platform is reliable, stable for our customers. We're serving our customers and giving them the tools. But that's exactly and what's we're a doing question everything now. in our power to turn it back on as soon as prudent. All right, we good? Yeah. All right, let's move along. So why should people believe you did this for the right reasons? Well, we, we have no choice. We have to comply with all financial uh, requirements. And the SEC hasn't said you had to do this. Well, lots of brokers uh, have to uh, comply with these financial requirements and, restrict and have issued restrictions on some of these names. Uh, and this is an industry-wide thing. You yourself met mentioned that other brokers this week have imposed restrictions. And not speaking for other firms, but for Robinhood in particular, this isn't because there's, uh, you know, deals happening with market makers we route to or market participants. But These then why are Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so if the last one he was on script and had his whole plan, he's in traffic now. You watch him when they ask the question, his eyes dart to his right. Now I'm going to do Greg Hartley eye movement 101. When a person deviates from their baseline, something has changed. Well, he's been recording and paying attention and looking at something and pulling all that data together. You see him immediately jump to the right to come up with some kind of an answer. And I think what he's doing is stringing words from lots of different places together to try to come up with an answer for this because he uses some really odd words for a guy who's talking about SEC regulation and Wall Street. He says lots of brokers. Well, it, maybe I'm missing something, but lots of brokers is probably not the way brokers are regulated. I would imagine all brokers have the same set of rules. There may be, depending on how you're listed and how you're structured, some different set of rules. But he says all, then he, or he says lots of, and then he jumps to, uh, and we're regulated and, and, and. But he's scrambling to string together a set of words that don't fit everything he's said to now. And I think he's cautious. He's been coached. Don't speak for the entire industry. So he says, well, I'm not speaking for the entire industry. And he backpedals a little there. If, if he's prepared before, he's not here. He's now in a bind and his brain is jumping around like a squirrel in the road trying to figure out where to go next. And he's stringing together almost an incoherent line of words that don't mean exactly what he's trying to say. We, I said earlier, you got to be really careful how much of your ugly baby you air in public. And if in fact, Mark, he's running short of money and we know that they got, I think you said three and a half billion dollars and it was yeah. one billion like that. If they needed that inject of cash and he's sitting in front of people, this is early, this is not today. He certainly doesn't want to say, hey, look at my ugly baby and talk about his business in that way. So you can see him stringing this together. He's like a kid in traffic. And you can see he's doing like a little kid that brow is up the whole time, almost terrified in this situation. That's fight or flight kicking in. And now Chris Cuomo has him on the ropes and he's going after him. So Scott, what do you got? All right. Um, again, we see him turtling. That's when your shoulders come forward and you start getting smaller like that. If you watch behind him, if you watch those stairs, you'll see his shoulders, like on this brown chair right here, If you'll, you'll see his shoulders come up and down when he's doing that. At this point, his shoulders come up and they really don't go down. You know, he does that quite often and you can see him come in just a little bit. And as he's speaking to parts of these, his, his chin comes down to guard his neck. 
that suggests that he's that's that's what you'll see when someone is afraid of something. You'll see that happening, and when they're not being honest with you, sometimes not all the time because there are no absolutes. You'll see that happen as well. When you're in interrogation and you're just getting to the part where where you're really getting heavy on them, and they start talking about things that are that they said they did they didn't do, and vice versa, you see that as well. Um, I get, let's, Mark always brings up the background of stuff. So let's talk about that for just a second. In the back, if you'll see, this is set up perfectly because he's sitting here and he's almost like a V. You can see him going down like this. His head's here going down. These are, his shoulders are fairly even in where they are. His hair is dark. His, his clothes are dark. Everything back there has been, has been framed. Literally, he's framed in that doorway as he sits there. And he's got those two things on the side, which make, it, which make it symmetric. And then you also see, symbolically, the stairs heading up behind his head. That's There's more there. He's, he's intelligent, a little bit more than, than what we see. It's brilliant. And I think that was set up, because why would you do that in that room anyway? You do it like we do in our office. You wouldn't be going out somewhere, and you know he's got an office at the house. So that's where you would do it. So he's had somebody come and say, here's what we're going to do. We have to make it look like this. They may not have said the specific things I'm talking about, but they know the way it's supposed to look and the symbolic things you're supposed to hook up. That's why you've got that chair and that book, or that, those two little tables with that book and that little picture over there. Because I'll bet you $1,000 if you go to his house right now, that stuff's not there. If he's going to do some more interviews, honey, help me get the stuff lined up. We got to get the get that the same little table. Let's get that little thing put on there. And he sets that up. Those two little things because that is perfect where he's sitting. Uh, the only thing that bothers me about this is his mic isn't that good, you know. But it but it looks good. It looks the way it should. And um, that's what I got for that. Mark, what do you got? Or Chase, what do you got? Yeah, right away we see him launch into some internal dialogue, or his eyes are are moving off to his right. I think he's rehearsing something. So if someone at, tells you, sits you down and says, this is what you need to say. When you're going to recall that or when you're going to think about what it's going to sound like, that's where your eyes will move. They'll typically move a little further down than his did. I may be a little off the mark here. But there's more shrugging, more eyebrow raising right when he's talking about financial requirements and that the lower eyelids start to raise as he gets called out. So Chris turns up the volume a little bit, starts calling him out. The lower eyelid comes up a little bit. We only really do this for two reasons, and that's to protect ourselves and anger. And there's some more head shaking here. There's compliance and requirements. There's head shaking. When he denies that there's deals happening, there's head shaking. And there's a single shoulder shrug, which is one shoulder going up, followed by a confirmation glance to the host. So he's looking at Chris. And I think it's interesting here that all of this comes together. A, there's also no answer to the question. Still did not answer the question, and he's ambiguous. So an ambiguous question is anything, sort of, that doesn't really answer the question. So if I asked Scott, and what'd you do on Wednesday night? And Scott said, well, I usually go straight home. That's not an answer. That's an ambiguous answer. And that's what we got here. So we rate that as a as a four on the deception scale. This one segment here, he would have scored a 19 if he was in an interrogation. Hmm. Mark? Yeah, yeah. I think you're right, Chase, because this isn't about um, regulatory compliance. It's about financial requirements. And, and if you're going to, you know, play in England and be Robin Hood, you're going to need a war chest the same as King John has, you know, if you're going to go in there against the Sheriff of Nottingham. And at this point, my understanding, again, tell me if I'm wrong down below, is that they don't have the war chest right now. They don't have the cash. Now, you know, as Greg's been saying, you can't just come out with it and go, man, we just don't have the cash to support this. And, and you know, our market makers just aren't going to do it for free. They want the cash in their hands, uh, they don't think we're good for it. And the shares that we're dealing with are, are, you know, really volatile. So they want even more money from us in order to do this kind of trading. He's not coming out with that, which leaves him in a bit of a position. And I think to Scott's point, uh, he doesn't have the pitch for this. And what he's left with is, well, I, you know, I'm the victim. 
I just got no choice. You know, there's requirements, there's restrictions. I mean, it's industry wide. I mean, we're all in this boat where we're just restricted. And, and you know, others are the same. Others are, yeah, others are the same, but others have the war chest and he doesn't have it right now. And I think that's the difference. You can tell me if I'm wrong down below, but I think I'm factually accurate around this. And so what's interesting is, is he really is on the back foot now. He doesn't have a pitch ready for this. He's got a whole bunch of his investors out there uh, watching this. Um, potentially he's got a whole bunch of hawks as well going, ah, this is a guy who needs lending and needs lending desperately. So we could make some money out of this one. He needs four and a half billion of cash to make this business work right now. And, and you know, he's desperate. You know, never be the person who's forced to borrow or forced to sell. Never be forced on any of those. And he's in a forced situation. So tough, tough position for him. Uh, and that's what I got on that one. All right. So why should people believe you did this for the right reasons? Well, we, we have no choice. We have to comply with all financial uh, requirements. And the SEC hasn't said you had to do this. Well, lots of brokers uh, have to uh, comply with these financial requirements and restrict and have issued restrictions on some of these names. Uh, and this is a industry wide thing. You yourself met, mentioned that other brokers this week have imposed restrictions and not speaking for other firms, but for Robinhood in particular, this isn't because there's, uh, you know, deals happening with market makers we route to or market participants. But These then why? Very good. Yeah. But These then why are... did you allow people to keep selling but not buying? The reason that is so troubling to people is that they were making money buying the stock because they were against the short side. And so by enabling them to sell but not buy, it sounds like you were allowing the hedge funds, and again, one of them owns a piece of you, and they had a big short position, and that looks like a stinky conflict that you didn't come out straight on from the start. Address that. Well, not, none of that had anything to do with our decision to do this. Again, this was just looking at regulatory requirements, financial requirements, um, and we 100% will always protect our customers where the entire business is operating to empower individual investors and has been since its founding. And that's what Robinhood is committed to continue to do. So we, want, we don't want to restrict buying in these 13 stocks. Um, we're doing the best we can to re-enable it as long as it's operationally and, uh, and, and prudent from a deposit standpoint. All right, I'll go first on this one. Uh, here we see his shallow breathing increase because he's in panic mode still. So at the very beginning of this, we see when he's sitting there trying to be really still, we see him almost bobbling back and forth. This, if you, when you're going to see it again, like Chase said, you'll see this again in a few minutes and in, in just a couple minutes. And when you look at it, think of uh, some, a drunk driver being talked to by the police or they're getting ready to give them the test because this guy looks exactly, that's exactly what they look like when they're getting ready to fall over or throw up on somebody. That's what they look like. I don't know if his brain's been bobbled by what's going on, but he's definitely trying to pay attention and, and trying to, to keep his head together with what's happening. Cause again, you see his eyes darting back and forth and trying to lock in on, on Cuomo as he, as he's talking to him. Um, again, we see his, we see his eyebrows up when his eyebrows are up, that's when he's he's spewing out, spewing out the stuff that he's rehearsed, that the thing that's ready to go. But he's sort of at the same time he's remained locked down in his his illustrators from his body, but he's still using his head and his eyebrows a lot as he does it. I ran into a guy one time at the Entrepreneur Center, and I I was videoing this, and the guy he wasn't much of a, of an an illustrator. I was like, man, you've got to start when you start talking about things. The illustrators are the things you're, when your brain is emphasizing specific words or phrases, like I did just then, specific words or phrases. So when you come to specific parts of your pitch, you want to talk about the finances, you want to talk about this, and in four years it's this as we move along to this many years. And this guy was doing nothing but using his eyebrows. And I remember, Greg, I sent you that. I said, oh, yeah, I'm I remember. see this. And he, but he ended up getting like eight million bucks from Google. Didn't but, work. So, with that pitch and I was sitting there going, Oh, you should change. Whatever. So we changed some things since then. So since that pitch, but his whole thing was just with his eyebrows. It was almost every word he said was going up and down like this. 
as I talked to him about it, I was like, dude, why are you doing it like this? And that, those were his illustrators. So you'll see that every now and then. I don't think that's what it is with this guy, though, in general. I don't think he's been raised where he has to be still and all that. Because watching some other videos of him, he moves around fluidly. He's he's very, you know, flowy with his motion. And in this case, he's just locked up because he's got to make sure and got to focus on what he's saying. His eyebrows are wide, or his eyebrow, his eyes are open. And again, you see his eyebrows. One of the reasons they're they're pulled up like that. Going back to this, you've got to get that person to engage with you. So you want to get that happening so it pulls your eyes open so they look a little bit wider. You've got the obiculus, obicularis oculi down here that pulls your, your eyes down. You don't want to do that because it looks weird. But when you get your eyebrows up and you're getting that request for approval and you start shaking your head yes, like we talked before, that person's mirror neurons kick in and they start shaking their head yes. And you subconsciously, and Chase will be able to speak to this as well, will get you into that mode of, of, of agreeing with them. It's almost like a, it's almost like a hypnotist working with them sometimes when they're doing the snake or whatever it is you all do, Chase. Snake. So, you know, when you see those, you see those, the, the, and those old cartoons of the guy with a, with a little horn and there's a uh, cobra coming up out of the basket and, and you start also, doing that. And then as a kid, you run around trying to do that to everybody. You say, dude. And, and, so that's what, that's what we used to do as kids anyway. That Bugs was day Bunny. one of my hypnosis training. <laughs> they said it's all, they said, don't do this probably. Standard stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I could never be a hypnotist then. So that's what I've got. Chase, what do you got? Well, it's hard to, hard to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you're watching YouTube right now. You're listening to YouTube right now, whatever the case may be. You might be cooking dinner. But just imagine if someone rushed up to you and said, I need you to search your entire computer for a document that contains the word graffiti or whatever on it. And you rush down to the search bar and try to find the information that you didn't know where it is in the first place. When your brain does that, it makes your eyes move left and right. Most of the time, sometimes a little bit upward. This is called a trans derivational search for the sciency name for it. But when we're scrambling for data, that's what we see. And we see this in this video right as he's being asked the question. He starts to realize what's around the corner. What am I going to have to deal with? And you see the eyes start to move doing that transderivational search. And another deceptive behavior. And let me just throw this caveat in here. There's not technically a behavior for deception. There's a behavior for stress. And when we're saying something's deceptive, it's kind of interchangeable with the word stress. But there, I'm going to just keep saying deception here. So there's lip licking. And this is a hygienic movement made to improve your appearance to the other person, selling the story a little bit, sell the pitch. And this happens before he answers, while he's listening to the question, which makes it more likely to be deceptive when we see it in this instance. And this head shaking continues throughout his answer. And the upward tone starts again when he says, we want to empower investors, question mark. And there, but there's slight nodding. He's not shaking his head. He starts nodding right when he's speaking about continuing to move on. And the only time he has a downward tone is when he says, if this is prudent from an investment standpoint. And overall, I think this is very deceptive, but I also think it's very elusive and evasive to boot. So that he's not being deceptive mm -hmm. as in the person's asking a question and he's providing a false answer. The deception is coming out of evasion instead of deception. Greg? Yeah, so I'm going to go a different route. I think he's getting real-time advice somehow. I don't know what he's getting it from. I don't think he's rifling through his brain. I think he's like a... A squirrel in the road going, what am I going to say? And he's getting real-time advice. And the reason I say that is because there are a handful of key words. He does a mission statement. He repeats their mission statement. You know, we're about helping average people have access to the stock market in a way they never have. He says financial, I forget his exact terms, but he says something about financial. Then he uses the word operational, which for me is a little odd. And then he talks prudence. That feels like a guy, a crusty old guy sitting there saying, mention these things. Whether it's a crusty old guy or a crusty young guy or somebody who's operationally savvy, who's feeding him information. That's what I think we're seeing, my opinion. And the reason I say that is because every time he hits one of those key points, go back, turn the sound off and watch. 
when he uses those key words, financial, operational, prudence, his forehead is up and locked. And I think what we're seeing is he's getting some real-time words and he's stringing them together to say what to say right now. Because I, I would assume if the guy I worked for most of my career, who's a CEO, was in a bind and I was sitting on the other end, I would be able to see it and say, hey man, calm down, use these words. And that probably is the same thing that they would do for him. Just my first impression and could be way off, but it sure looks like he's being fed words and he's trying to say something. That's the reason his eyes are rattling around. That's mine. Uh, Greg, Mark, what do you have? Yeah, I agree with I agree with you, Greg. I just did a consulting for somebody who's in a major uh, court battle right now that's mm -hmm. on the news. And they're going through a deposition. And their natural eye home, which is like where a person naturally looks to recall information if you ask them stuff, was up and to their left. Sure. So I had to buy a $60 tripod from Amazon and put an iPad up there with all of my advice, my speaking points and my notes is Smart. right up here. So he's on, and that's one of the benefits of coaching uh, a deposition person, you know, a, a deponent through a Zoom call because they can have notes and stuff like that. So the person's looking like this, and it looks like they're doing a data recall, but they're reading the notes. And I think that it's very, very possible. So guys, I'm going to hijack one minute here, only because I think if this is the first time you're watching this, and I'm saying Hartley's eye movement, or if this is the first time you're watching us and Chase is talking about this, it makes absolutely no sense to you. There are schools of thought that say that all this eye movement thing we're talking about are voodoo, and then there are schools of thought who believe absolutes. What I'm going to tell you is right now, listen, and you can see what we're talking about. I'm not going to try to explain anything more than just 30 seconds. I'm going to ask you to remember the last song you heard and what is the fifth word of that last song. Now pay attention to your own eyes. They're going to do something. And in most cases, it's going to be to the side. I'll leave it at that because I'm not going to tell you where it goes. I could do a magic trick and tell you what I think and get it pretty damn close. But what we know is that when people are ac accessing information, their eyes move around their head. And for most of us, it'll be if the channel is single, auditory versus visual, it'll be a different place. So we can ask enough questions that we get that. Now, if I ask you, hey, Chase, what'd you do last Tuesday? Then you're going to get all of it rifled together and your eyes will dart all kinds of places and may even drop down to some emotional things. But what we're talking about is if you ask the correct questions and you frame everything in the right place, you can find where a person goes for information and then you can look for deviation. That's all we're talking about. And we'll do a whole thing on that another time. But right now, we just don't want you to think that we're talking in, you know, snake handling speak or something. It's just that. Cool. Good point. I think it was Mark. Next. Yeah. So look, here's what I think at this point is, is, regardless of what the eye access and cues might mean or don't mean, I think he's at the top of his neural load here under these circumstances. Super smart guy, totally. But if I can get, if I take the smartest brain and I fill it with some adrenaline, the first thing that's going to happen is uh, it's going to lose its short-term memory. So any conversation that I've had with that brain beforehand, that's gone. Because with adrenaline, yeah, your brain doesn't need to know what you just learned a few minutes ago. It's going back to instinct. And so it's actually literally going to start draining blood from the neocortex to the limbs. So you don't have any of that smartness that you used to have when you're in fight and flight you're under pressure here's another indicator is we get that head wobble that i was talking about which is so close to the to pre somebody fainting yeah watch somebody if they get some bad news or uh or as, as scott was saying you know they're just about to be written a ticket you know and the blood starts draining from their face as they realize oh, i'm in big trouble here and you'll see that little head wobble, and then they'll recover as they go, oh, I can't faint, that would be really embarrassing right now. The heart rate goes goes up and they, and they you know, re-establish uh, themselves around that. So I think we're seeing that for sure. We get that swallow. Uh, we get the lip lick that I think uh, Chase was talking about as well, and lip compression as well. So, you know, lots of interesting indicators there. But I'm going to move forward a little bit to um, no pressure from the market makers um, uh, just requirements, okay? No pressure from the market makers, just requirements. I think at that point we get a head shake, we get a tongue 
to the side as well. I think that's something that Greg has brought up a number of times, which is the kid who's trying to get things right. It's like, I'm, I'm now going to have to really concentrate as I get the message out, which is there was no pressure from market makers. It was only requirements. And I think this character at this point is fighting for his life to get that information out because he's under a lot of pressure right now. Listen, this is why, this is why when we're working with people in order to do this kind of TV appearance and it's crisis, they're under pressure, that you stress test them because they, yes, they're smart. They're super smart. They've built an incredible company. Yes, they've got the messaging. They can do it by rote. But you have to hit them with a bunch of adrenaline. You have to hit them with adrenaline so they find out what it's like, how the brain works under pressure. So absolutely, you can trigger them in all kinds of ways. And if you're not able to, to trigger them at a psychological level, you just send them for a run round the block. You just, <laughs> that's all you do is like, right, run round the block two times, come back, sit down, and then we'll do the interview, okay? And now they're full of adrenaline and they can't remember what you trained them in. And, that you know, you've got to do that. That's that's the situation that I think he's under uh, right now. Um, look, I think, you know, coming up is potentially a... a a deposition that he'll give to Congress. I think maybe on the on the on the 18th of February. Don't know whether that'll happen or not. Those can be pretty harsh. Those can be pretty hairy. And uh, you know, he'll be even more prepared around that. So maybe if that happens and there's something interesting, we'll come back to it and maybe give it another another look. If you think this is a story that's going to run and something that you're interested in, let us know uh, below and we'll maybe cover it again. But. That's all I got for that one. But then why did you allow people to keep selling but not buying? The reason that is so troubling to people is that they were making money buying the stock because they were against the short side. And so by enabling them to sell but not buy, it sounds like you were allowing the hedge funds. And again, one of them owns a piece of you and they had a big short position. And that looks like a stinky conflict that you didn't come out straight on from the start. Address that. Well, not, none of that had anything to do with our decision to do this. Again, this was just looking at regulatory requirements, financial requirements, um, and we 100% will always protect our customers where the entire business is operating to empower individual investors and has been since its founding. And that's what Robinhood is committed to continue to do. So we want, we don't want to restrict buying in these 13 stocks. Um, we're doing the best we can to re-enable it as long as it's operationally and, uh, and, and prudent from a deposit standpoint. All right, great. Now let's throw it around the room and get everybody's thoughts on what we've looked at, where you think this guy's being honest, where you think he's being um, deceptive. What do you think? Mark, uh, Greg, let's start with you. Yeah, I, I'm going to say, like I said, you're not going to air your ugly baby in front of public. This guy's going to tell you what he can tell you and what he must tell you. And he's doing the right thing and trying to keep his company on an even keel. I, do I think he's hedging? Oh, absolutely. He's hedging. No, no pun intended. But I think he's hedging and he's guarding information that we later find out that he had a big inject of cash. So was he prepared? Yeah. Is he smart? Yeah, the guy's brilliant. But to your point, Mark, Adrenaline gets to, the two amygdalas outvote one brain all day. And that's what we're seeing. Chase. I think this was a deceptive interview. I think it was deceptive in avoidance, not deceptive in deliberate presentation of false information. So it was avoidant, which is to be expected of somebody like this. But if it was a totally honest interview, he would have said, I'm not going to answer that. Here's what I will answer. That's what an honest interview would have sounded like. This was not an honest interview. Mark? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, he's, he's maybe not being deceptive, but he's not being totally honest about what potentially the real issue is, which is liqu liquidity, that they don't have at this point enough cash to really run the business that he'd set up there, which is anybody can buy and sell whatever they like at 
any point and they won't be charged anything. Uh, he doesn't have the liquidity for, for that at that point and he doesn't want to say that. Uh, is he in bed with those uh, market makers or the, or the hedge funds? I think he's being honest when he says that they haven't told him to do anything. I think the question is, is are you thinking of them? Are you influenced by them? You know, maybe a question is, is has it benefited uh, some of your clients or your investors by this action? And did you think at the time that actually this would benefit them uh, uh, as well? I mean, those those are, I think, the pertinent questions here. Uh, Scott, what's your thought? Yeah, I think we're seeing him in panic mode. I think he, he knows what's happened. I think he knew it going in. I think that whole group of them knew it when it started happening. And we're literally seeing him like a boxer, bob and weave to get around those things. And he's using every tool he's got that, that he knows to use that he's got to get to, to put things in front of, of him to guard him and his company from this, mostly himself, because he keeps throwing his, his us and we, you know, sort of the company under the bus and saying, it's not just me. So I think we're seeing him bobbing and weaving because he knows what he did was wrong. And he knows this, that, that Cuomo's right and asked, the way he's asking these questions, that he's in trouble and could possibly be in trouble. And that's what I think we're seeing. I think we're seeing a whole lot of deception here. So we good? Yeah. Good. All right. Well, thanks for watching and please subscribe. We, we, tr we, we, we try every week to, to keep reminding you to do that. Please subscribe. And if you, if you want to be reminded when we have something come out, just hit the little bell that pops up once you subscribe, and that'll let you know we have new video. They come out on Thursdays, but they come out on Wednesdays if we get them edited quick enough. All right. Is that it? Yeah. All right. See thanks you. so much, guys. I'll see you next time. Bye now. With the Hailier panel. Chase looks like he's doing the commercial for uh, the North Face. Look at him. <laughs> <laughs> Act like you're throwing a football. Give it one of those. <laughs> Put your chin out. There you go. <laughs> That's it. That's it. That's it. Or do the one where you look at your, at your, you do the time and one of those. Do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's definitely, that's knitwear catalog where you're, looking, where you're looking, <laughs> pointing at your watch and, and, and looking somewhere That's around. it. That's the one. Yeah, that's yeah. the one. You're that's right. why you have, to, you have to have your knee up on something as well. <laughs> I did a photo. I did a Vogue photo shoot and they had me do the same thing. He's like, okay, look at your watch. Okay, but don't look at it. Look off. Like, there's a bus coming. He said, there's a bus coming. Look for the bus. Look for the bus. I'm going to say, I don't know, I'm going to say, I don't know, I'm going to say, I don't know.